Welcome back, everybody. Let's continue to talk about attitudes. Let's finish our discussion of persuasion by focusing on some audience characteristics. If you think about our success in persuading someone, a lot of that depends on who that someone is. And one key factor focuses on how much that person likes to think deep thoughts. That's what need for cognition is all about. Need for cognition distinguishes people based on how much they enjoy thinking, based on how much they enjoy effortful cognitive activities. This should probably make sense to you. People who are high in a need for cognition they tend to process persuasive messages via the central route because they crave information. Now, of course, they're going to be persuaded mostly by strong arguments and much less by source characteristics such as the attractiveness of the speaker or the fluency of the speaker or the number of arguments that the speaker uses. On the other hand, people who are low in need for cognition, they tend to process persuasive messages via the peripheral route. So they're much more likely to rely on superficial peripheral cues like the speaker's reputation or the speaker's physical appearance, or perhaps they might even be influenced by how much other people are reacting to the speaker's message because if other people like the message, they'll be more likely to support it too. Need for cognition is usually measured via a brief questionnaire. And here are a couple items that are often used in a scale that's trying to measure somebody's need for cognition. So you would be characterized as relatively high in need for cognition if in general you agree with statement one, three, and five. So statement one says, I really enjoy a task that involves coming up with new solutions to problems. Uh, the notion of thinking abstractly is appealing to me. I usually end up deliberating about issues even when they do not affect me personally. So you can tell that's someone who really likes to think. If they're thinking about your problems simply because they want to work through that problem and find a solution, they are really high in need for cognition. But now, people who are high in need for cognition, they would disagree with items 2, 4, and 6. So, thinking is not my idea of fun. That is clearly not something that someone who is high in need for cognition would endorse. I like tasks that require little thought once I've learned them. Someone who's very high in need for cognition, they want new puzzles put in front of them all the time every day. Number six, it's enough for me that something gets the job done. I don't care how or why it works. That's clearly not a statement that someone who is high in need for cognition would endorse because they want to understand things forward and backward. Well, speaking of engaging in deep thoughts, Deep thoughts can help you resist persuasion. That's good news. So of course, it's not uncommon that someone is trying to change our attitude and we often want to protect against that. Well, researchers have asked people to describe the ways in which they resist persuasion. And in general, when attacked, attitude bolstering and counter arguing are both very common techniques and really they're very intelligent strategies. Let's talk about those. Attitude bolstering is essentially attitude strengthening. So if somebody is trying to attack your attitude, you might reassure yourself with facts that support the validity of your beliefs. Counter arguing is another really intelligent strategy. That's where you're essentially playing devil's advocate and you're thinking to yourself, what possibly could this person say to try to change my attitude? Because if you can think of what they're gonna say, you can think of a counter argument. Another interesting strategy that people use is social validation. So someone who uses that strategy might say, I also rely on other people with the same opinion to be there for me. And in general, what they're saying is they rely on social support. The researchers found that people mentioned a variety of other strategies too. And these strategies don't really seem like they're very productive. Let's talk about some of them. One would be just simply feeling negative affect. So somebody who's using that strategy might say, I tend to get angry when someone tries to change my beliefs. And that's really not helpful at all. Another one is asserting your confidence. So somebody using that strategy might say, I doubt that anybody could change my viewpoint. And that's really just kind of closed-minded. Selective exposure is kind of interesting. Somebody using that strategy might say, most of the time I just ignore them. And another common thing that came up when these researchers were asking people about their strategies was source derogation. So somebody using that strategy might say, I look for faults in the person presenting the challenging belief. So they're looking for faults in the person who's trying to change their attitude. And that's just simply juvenile. So 
if I were to categorize these different strategies that are commonly used, I'd say that some of them are productive, but those last several are really not very productive at all. Let's continue to talk a little bit more about resisting persuasive attempts. If we expect a persuasive challenge, we can inoculate ourselves. Think about an analogy. Think about how we inoculate ourselves against various diseases. As you know, vaccines help us acquire an immunity to particular diseases. And vaccines typically contain some type of biological agent that either resembles the disease or it can be made from some weakened or dead form of the disease. And the vaccine then stimulates our body's immune system to recognize that threat and then destroy it, you know, like both now and in the future. Well, attitude inoculation works in a similar way. By exposing ourselves to weak versions of a persuasive attack, we can bolster our later resistance to that attack. How does that work? Well, it's kind of like preparing for a debate. Think about if you were preparing for a debate. You would be thinking to yourself, what is the other side going to say to me? How are they going to try to get me to change my attitude? What types of arguments are they going to have? And as you think about those arguments, you're then going to develop counter arguments. And then by thinking about what they're going to say, and preparing our counter arguments, we're essentially preparing for, practicing for that debate. We're bracing ourselves for that confrontation. There are some other mechanisms that allow us to resist persuasive attempts. If you think about it, particularly in the USA, we really do cherish our freedom to think any way we want. So it makes sense that we're often kind of stubborn and that we dig in when others try to persuade us. That's what psychological reactance is all about. What we're doing is reacting to threats to our freedom by fighting back in some way. So for example, we might simply shut down and tune out whoever's trying to influence us. Or we might go on the offensive by providing counterattacks or by questioning the person's credibility. As I've mentioned several times in this section, persuasion isn't easy and it's particularly difficult when someone knows that you're coming and they know you're going to try to influence them. That's why the best persuasive appeals are the ones that an audience doesn't recognize as persuasive appeals at all. Well, that's it for this section, my friends, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon. <laughs>